And another pass, rolling on. I love that approach. It gets so much more consistent buildup in forces. As you're setting up your mills and you're looking to establish your common tooling, one of the questions I get asked is what face mill is the best face mill to have in there so you only really have to have one loaded? Well, like so many of the videos I will share with you, it really depends. But the good news is, is I have some questions for you to help you figure out where you are to make the best decision for your situation. How fast do you want to rip down the material? If you do a lot of facing, you're going to want more teeth. How robust and rigid is your setup? How are you holding the workpiece? What spindle is in your machine? All of these questions are going to help you identify the best tool for your application. Let's check out some of the cutting today. And you can just watch it rip off. We can listen to it with our ears and just hear it ripping away the steel. Now, this isn't ridiculously fast, but if you look at the size of the taper, as well as the size of the cutter, the combination you're seeing is actually pretty impressive. It's also only taking a few short seconds. You've already got two passes done. And now we're looking at the high feed version. It is available in two different entry angles. Boom, done. And notice how interrupted that cut is. That amount of interruptions normally would have a lot of forces being applied and removed and applied and removed, and you'd kind of end up with a faced surface. <laughs> Obviously, this is an exaggeration, but not really when you start to throw it on the CMM and run a profile of your face, because anywhere there's a relief in the cutting pressure, it's going to dig or it's going to push. However, with this cutter, that's not a concern. And another pass, rolling on. I love that approach. It gets so much more consistent buildup in forces. So a lot of what's special about this cutter is right here in this insert. You can see the large amount of carbide up here. The large amount of carbide that's up here allows for a lot of heat absorption, right? Like it's just gonna be pulling that heat out of the material, out of the cut, into the carbide. And then you've got a massive chunk and piece of carbide that's there so it's not fragile or brittle but with the advances that they've had to the shapes of the dies and the ways that they can grind and prepare these inserts you're actually able to get this massively thick chunk of carbide with a positive cutting geometry now a positive cutting geometry typically would have had to have a high relief angle on that back face which would make that leading edge extremely brittle and a brittle edge as we all know one hit it's gone and it explodes so the uneven cuts you watched would just be a total amount of failure. So in your softer materials where you really need that positive cutting material, like the mild steels and aluminums and other stuff, you wouldn't be able to do it with this type of material. You wouldn't be able to push it quite as hard because you'd have nothing to soak up all that heat. Or you might be able to do it, but then you're trying to like sacrifice performance and productivity to just kind of get her done. We've all been there, just not a great place to be. Oh, just look at it rip. Not to mention, bigger carbide means bigger screws. Longer reaches because you can change the approach angle with the same insert, different cutter bodies. So you can get those long reach applications. Now you might be thinking, okay, Arthur, but I wanna see some success stories keep watching. Now, this is with the first entry angle, the 25 degree lead, if you'll recall, is their high feed application. No finishing tool needed. This is really the kicker. I don't know how many times I would have a tool to rough out the bulk of the material, and then I'd have to come back with a finisher. And in the worst case scenario, depending on the setup rigidity and the amount of force I was putting down into the part, I'd have to come by with a fly cutter. For those of you not familiar, it's an archaic tool with a single point and it works, but at the cost of productivity. And then you have the 42 degree angle, which puts less force back into the spindle. And again, it's all around the time savings or the cycle time per component, whatever it's going. The tool life is obviously gonna be larger. Once you have a larger chunk of carbide soaking up that heat and bracing for those impacts, naturally your tool life is gonna come around. And the really cool thing about this is the cost per edge actually works out to be cheaper 
because whether you're making a cutting insert with four cutting positions or you're making one with 14 positions, they're still gonna have that processing time and it's a natural component of making something no matter how complex or simple it might be. And now after you've seen some of the success stories and the huge cost savings they've seen, you might be saying, well, how can I find out what tool? Well, you can reach out to someone in your supply chain who specializes in studying these tools but we can go over a quick little bit of an assortment here. Going through the Sandvik site, I'll put a link down below. And once you click on face mail, okay, it's gonna start listing all of them. You got this whole uh, add to my catalogs, show more, all of that. But the real values here in the filter option, where you can then go by whatever entry angle you want. Let's say we're only looking at 25, apply. Then we can restrict the cutting diameter. I'm looking for 63.5 mil. And then boom, it's gonna restrict it to what I have here. And then from here, I can pick whether I want more teeth in the H designation. So I would have seven inserts on here and I've got five on here. And that's gonna change your spacing. That's gonna change your forces. That's gonna change your cost per load, per index. One of the things we didn't get to see in the video because they recorded dry for the footage so you can see the material sharing is the through tool coolant as well and that coolant delivery to each edge. And then from here, once you have your cutter selected, you would simply be able to build your tool assembly. And from there, you would start picking out all your components. When you find the tool you want first, it's great because you can just click here and you can start looking machine side. What do I want? Yeah, I'm going to an HSK A63, apply, boom, select. Now I've got a complete assembly. It's going to generate my downloads. And now I've got a complete assembly and I can twirl it around here and make it look all pretty. Or you can download the STP, the DXF, or the GTC package. You get some of the length, you get the weight of the complete assembly, which is always really handy especially when you've got side mounted tool changers and different tool change arms with weight limitations and well, more complex assemblies than this. I hope you got to see a little bit about one of the face mills that make a big difference when you have a lot of facing to do. When you've got the carousel capacity to have a dedicated facer, you can't go wrong with the 745 from Sandvik Cormont. The versatility, the range, and just the amount of carbide they have there to suck up the heat so you're not having to worry about using multiple tools to face. And you're not having to worry about those fragile cutting edges and blowing them out as you continue to run. It's good to know that you have an option. So you could buy this, equip this, put it in your mill, and that's one step closer to keeping your spindle turning and earning.